God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. Hey everyone, my name is Petra and welcome back to another week of Junior Youth. Today we'll continue the story of God. The past two weeks, you've learned about how God created the earth and how we as humans fit into his creation. So let's recap. Can anyone remember, who is the Trinity? That's right, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are three persons and one God. Does anyone remember what the Garden of Eden was like? What two places overlapped there? Heaven and earth overlapped in the Garden of Eden. Humans lived alongside God. They were made in His image to reflect Him and rule over creation with Him. But when humans sinned against God, they were separated from His presence and forced to leave the garden. But did God give up on humans? No, even after humans sinned and were separated from Him, God made a special promise, a covenant, that He would send someone to save us from our sins. Because as Brody talked about last week, we can't do it ourselves. Today, we'll talk about this savior. The entire Old Testament points to him. Shout out his name. Does anyone know what books in the Bible tell us about Jesus' life on earth? The first four books of the New Testament, also called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's talk about the incarnation. God steps into his own story as a human being. Jesus, do you remember playing Would You Rather last week and Brody asked, would you rather listen to your favorite song in your headphones or see it live at a concert? Obviously, you would rather see it in real life. It's the same way with Jesus. Even though the whole Old Testament points to him, Jesus as a human is the fuller, completed version of these prophecies. So is Jesus God or human? It's a trick question. Jesus isn't 50% human and 50% God. He is 100% human and 100% God. John 1 verse 14 reads, the word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus, who is fully God, became a real human being and lived alongside humans. So he's both. If we want to know what the perfect human is like, we look at Jesus. And if we want to find out what God is like, we also look at Jesus. Jesus is holy, eternal, and love, just like God. But he also had all the human limitations and experiences that we have. Let's start with how Jesus was fully human. When Jesus came to earth, what was he like? He came to earth as a baby growing inside Mary. Do babies have any control over their lives? Like what can they do? Babies can't really control anything. Imagine God, the creator of the universe, becoming a baby, only able to cry, sleep, and eat, depending entirely on others for food, getting around, and can't even talk. Here's another example. Think of someone super powerful, and with lots of authority, like a king or a president. And think of that person feeding the homeless on the streets or volunteering in a hospital. Does this person lose their job or their title? No, of course not. They don't lose their title as a ruler. They're still the king or president, but they put aside their power and become a servant to others. This is what God does by coming to earth as Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 6 to 7 says that Jesus, God's son, gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Even though Jesus was fully God, he was willing to put aside that power and become a human. Does anyone know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane? Leaders break into groups of three to four and have the kids who know the story share a short summary. In Gethsemane, Jesus experienced immense pain. 
The Gospel of Luke says, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Even though Jesus was fully God, he was not immune to suffering or pain. He experienced it throughout his life just like we do. Does anyone know what Jesus' friends did after he prayed in the garden? Jesus' closest friends abandoned him when he needed them most. Around your age, towards the end of grade school, a really good friend just stopped hanging out with me. It happened really quickly and I wasn't sure how to feel or who to hang out with for a few days. At the time, I didn't think about how Jesus also struggled with friendships. But when I look back, it would have been really comforting to know that Jesus experienced something similar. If you ever feel misunderstood or abandoned or struggle with friendships or loss, never forget that Jesus knows exactly how you feel. All the struggles we face in this broken world, Jesus faced them too. And this is why it's so beautiful that Jesus was fully human. He gets us. And because of this, we can talk to him about anything, including our struggles. Was there ever a time that you felt abandoned or lonely? Leaders can share first. How does it make you feel that Jesus experienced loneliness just like us? Now let's talk about how Jesus is fully God. Let's use eternal as an example. Last week, Brody read John 1 verse 1, which reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what does this tell us about Jesus? Jesus is God's Word. He was with God in the beginning. When God created the universe, Jesus was there too. He is eternal, just like God. He has all of God's characteristics because he is fully God. Before we jump into why Jesus came to earth, let's talk about some historical evidence that Jesus was a real person and fully God. There are many sources, but today you'll learn about three. The Talmud, Pliny the Younger, and Josephus. Leaders, skip this activity if you need to. Split your group into three. Give each group one of the quotes and talk about what does your quote tell us about Jesus? Let's start with the Talmud. It's a collection of ancient teachings from the Jews. A quote from the Talmud states, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, referring to Jesus, was hanged. This is evidence Jesus existed as a human and was hung on the eve of Passover. This also agrees with the timing of Jesus' death in the Gospels, but you'll learn about that in the next video. Pliny the Younger was a Roman governor several years after Jesus lived on earth. He wrote a letter to the Roman emperor asking for help handling Christian communities. He says this about Christians. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day, the Sabbath, before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God. Now, Pliny didn't like Christians, but he mentioned that Jesus existed, calling him the Christ. Pliny also mentions that Christian communities existed, proving that Jesus' life impacted others. There was another guy named Josephus. He was a Roman Jewish historian who wrote this nearly 2,000 years ago. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works a teacher of such men as receive the truth with pleasure. Josephus also states he was the Christ. Josephus directly mentioned Jesus' miracles, which he calls wonderful works. He also mentions that Jesus was a teacher. His statement, he, referring to Jesus, was the Christ, is very significant because Josephus never directly said he followed Jesus. Josephus calling Jesus the Christ tells us that people believe Jesus was the Savior, the one the whole Old Testament pointed to. So now that we've covered how God steps into his own story and the proof behind it, let's talk about why. What was the Old Testament pointing to? And what do the stories in the Old Testament tell us about what humans desperately need? The Old Testament tells us that humans, including us, desperately need a savior. We know this because Jesus says in Luke 24, the Old Testament points to God's promised savior who will defeat the evil snake, be the antidote to our sin and reunite us with God. Jesus is this promised savior for humanity. 
He is the snake crusher. Think back to when Brody talked about Jesus being tempted in the desert. Did he ever sin? Just shout out the answer. No, of course not. Jesus resisted temptation and he won against the snake. He lived exactly how humans were meant to live, perfectly reflecting God's image. And this is why his death and resurrection defeated the evil snake. And you'll find out more about this in the next video. So the main reason Jesus came to earth was to defeat the snake and wipe away our sins because we can't do it ourselves. But God could have left us poisoned by sin forever. Why did God choose to save us? God wants to live with humans perfectly, just like in the Garden of Eden. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's Jesus. God loves us so much that he gave up his son to be with us. But our sin separates us from him. What is the characteristic of God that starts with an H? God is holy. Because God is holy, our sin can't be around him. And that's why he sent his son to defeat evil so our sins could be washed away and we could be reunited with him. Life group leaders, have your kids open their Bibles to Mark 1 verse 14 to 15 and read this passage. What does Jesus say about the kingdom of God? In verse 15, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. Think back to the first video when Reuben talked about the Garden of Eden. He said, it's where God and humans could exist together in perfect unity, creating and caring and living in relationship. The Garden of Eden was God's kingdom. Just like God's presence was with humans in the garden, God's presence comes back to us through Jesus. And I'll use the new creation to talk about this. So throughout his life, Jesus casts a vision of what this new creation will look like by being the perfect human, living exactly how God designed humans to live. Let's watch this quick clip. We have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so, what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. So how did Jesus create little pockets of heaven or the new creation on earth. He forgave people's sins, healed their sicknesses, and loved them perfectly, even the people who were outcasts. Jesus also paints a picture of the new creation by understanding the heart behind God's laws and following them. Does anyone know what the Sermon on the Mount is? The Sermon on the Mount is a series of Jesus' teachings that tell us how humans should live. Jesus refers to the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. Life group leaders, split your group into two and have them write down as many of the Ten Commandments as they can, but without looking at their Bibles. See which group can remember the most. Almost all of the commandments you just wrote, Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount. Flip in your Bibles to Matthew 5, verses 21 to 26. Do not murder is one of the Ten Commandments. Many people in Jesus' time believed it was right to love your neighbor, but to hate your enemy. But what does Jesus tell them in verse 22? Jesus tells them that anyone who is even angry at another person has already committed murder in their heart. For those of you with siblings, I'm sure you've had arguments before. 
But think of what your relationship with your siblings could look like if you never got mad at each other. You never fought about toys or video games. You never yelled. That would be really nice, wouldn't it? By telling us to love even the people who are really hard to love, Jesus paints a picture of what the new creation, God's kingdom will look like. A place where there's no fighting, no hatred, no anger, just love. And Jesus didn't just teach about this new creation. He demonstrated it through his actions by completely following these laws. Jesus shows us what it means to live a life that's not poisoned by sin. He lived a righteous, a holy, and a loving life. He showed us that true love is actually serving others. Remember the Trinity? Because Jesus is God and God is love, Jesus transformed the lives of almost anyone who met him. One of my favorite stories is the woman at the well. So while Jesus is traveling, he goes out of his way to meet a Samaritan woman. Most Jews, like Jesus, avoided Samaritans at all costs. Does anyone know how this woman was treated? In her community, she was an outcast. Nobody wanted to be around her. But the thing is, Jesus doesn't treat her like everyone else does. He starts a conversation with her and tells her, an outcast, the good news, that Jesus is the savior of the world. In the Gospel of John, she is the first to hear this news and get to share it with others. Because of Jesus' love, this woman's life was radically changed. She was given a new hope, rooted in how much Jesus loved her. This is one of my favorite stories about Jesus because it shows how he perfectly loves everyone. Every single thing he did, he did out of love. He was never selfish, never bitter. He never gossiped or excluded anyone. He made everyone feel fully loved. This story is very convicting for me. Often, I'm tempted to avoid people who are outcasts or get made fun of because I'm afraid I'll be made fun of too. But it's really selfish for me to think this way. And this story reminds me that I'm called to love and care for all people, no matter who they are or what they've done. Who is someone in your life who you have a hard time loving? And what are some ways you can love them like Jesus loves you? This woman's life was changed because of Jesus' love. And we're called to share the same love with others. Remember the first video and how Ruben's life was changed after people shared the love of Jesus with him? Well, my life has been changed too. I grew up going to church as a kid, but I didn't understand Jesus in that he is love. As I grew up, I really stopped caring about my relationship with him. But when I saw people who truly loved Jesus, I noticed how their lives were different. They were more joyful, peaceful, kind, and grateful. And when these people encouraged me to know Jesus better, I realized how incredible he is and that he fully loves me and that's enough. My life has changed and it's still being changed every day. Leaders, share what your favorite Jesus story is and then ask your life group members if they have one too. Just like the woman at the well, myself and your life group leaders, think of how your life could change if you started connecting with Jesus. Maybe some of you are still unsure whether he's even real or not, and your first step would be coming to junior youth every night, and that's a great start. And maybe for others, you want to spend more time reading the Bible or praying. Life group leaders give each person a piece of paper and something to write with. Have them sit quietly and write down one or more ways they can connect with Jesus. Some of you might be wondering how Jesus saved us and what that looks like. Genesis 3 verse 15 mentions that Jesus will defeat the snake, but get hurt at the same time. But make sure to come back next week to learn about the greatest act of love in history. Now take some time to pray in groups of three to four. Make sure to say thank you that Jesus came to earth as our savior to reunite us with God. Say sorry that we've sinned and rejected Jesus and ask him to forgive us, help us connect with him and live like he did. Hey leaders, if you're short on time, you can skip the 10 commandments activity or you can skip reading the quotes about the proof that Jesus existed. Also, be ready to share what one of your favorite Jesus stories is. 
Maybe it's one that you connect with a lot, one that changed your view of Jesus, or one that's just really meaningful to you. And for prayer time, if there's not enough time, um, one of the leaders can pray or the leaders can pray in groups over the kids if they're not comfortable praying. Thanks.